Storehouse Dallas. Okay, so we're going to continue um, in Hebrews chapter 5, and you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles there. Um, last week, if you missed chapter 3 and chapter 4, I really encourage you to go back and, and give those a good old-fashioned listen. And, and as you're listening to it, just stop and meditate on the Word and, and, and really let the Word go deep. Um, I believe the Lord is really saying something to the body of Christ in this hour through this book. Um, okay, we're going to start in, um, actually we're going to start in chapter 4, verse 14, because that's how far we got last week. Um, I'm going to read it, and then uh, I'm going to teach on it. So follow along. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For if we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, for we do not have, I'm sorry, let me read that again. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he, is, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever in, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is skilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So um, I just thank you, Lord, for this word. I thank you, Lord, for chapter five. And I've titled this um, Jesus, Our High Priest. Um, and so he, he basically summarizes this at the end of chapter five. And he says, listen, <clears throat> let me just tell you that um, this is going to be a meaty um, exercise for you. This is going to be a meaty word because it's not just the simplicity of the gospel, but I actually expect you now to move beyond the basic principles and we're going to begin to eat meat. Now, for those of you that were here last week, you know that I told you that this is a Hebrew sandwich. And in the first several chapters, he talks about rest, which is bread. And in the last several chapters, he talks about faith, which is also bread. But in the middle of this book, there is some real great, delicious meat. It is like a ribeye sandwich. It is like we have gone to the best barbecue place in Dallas, and it is it is delicious meat, and it's going to feed you, and it's going to open us up, not just to the basics of the word, but to some real meaty and deep revelation. And so I want to challenge you this morning, because a lot of us come to church, and we're like, feed me, feed me. But 
a lot of us are like, I don't necessarily need my mind challenged. I just want the easy, I just want you to give me something that's easy to understand. Um, but I want to challenge you because the Lord said to love him with all of our minds. And that means that our minds don't stay where they are, but they increase and they grow. And, they, and we love him with all of our minds going, I want the fullness of all that the word has for me. You know, I don't want to stay as a baby in, in, in the word of God, but I really want to move on to some deep things. <clears throat> now, the author introduces some new concepts that actually can only be found in the New Testament through the book of Hebrews. He actually, he actually mentions this thing called the order of Melchizedek. So he's talking about a new kind of priesthood. And in chapter 5, he mentions it twice, but yet he gives no explanation. So that's really good because what he's doing is he's giving us an hors d'oeuvre. Like he's giving us, he's feeding us, and he's saying, now listen, I'm going to whet your appetite now. And then further along, um, Matthew's going to teach next week on chapter 6, but then he really begins to get into the order of Melchizedek in chapter 7, and I'm going to be teaching on that. And so he's talking about the new priesthood in 7, 8, and 9. And so we're really going to go deep in this because he says he's a forerunner in this priesthood. And whenever Jesus says he's a forerunner in something, that means that he paid a price so that you could walk in the same level of glory. So you could walk in the same order. Okay. So that's just to kind of give you a peek under the tent. All right, um, uh, the Melchizedek order, for those of you that want to kind of preempt this, it's um, explained in Psalm 110. All right, so he talks about the priesthood. So let's uh, look at uh, verse 14 again, chapter 4, verse 14. He said, seeing then that we have a great high priest. Now, wait a minute. Let me stop and let me just stop because in verse 13 and 12, he's saying, listen, the word of God knows everything. It has, the word of God has the ability to search you out, to search you out. Not only does the word of God know what he promised over you, but he knows your condition and where you are in, in the timeline of getting to the promise that God has for you. And so the word of God will search you out. He will find out what your condition is and he's invested in then getting you to that place because he already knows he kind of stuck a thermometer in you and said, uh, they don't have a fever. They're not hot enough. They need to be hot and I need to pour some coals on their, on their spiritual life. And I know just how to do that. Praise the Lord. As anybody like you're going along, you're like, oh, I'm loving the Lord. I love the Lord. And, 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 uh, and you're like, God, I just want more of you. I just want more of you. And all of a sudden somebody comes in, like your money goes away. And then you're going, you're on your knees every day. You know, I mean, you're getting hot real fast, right? Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So he said that no creature is hidden from his sight. Uh, this is verse 13, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Okay, so uh, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. All right, so um, so he's, he's basically saying the most interesting thing. He's saying now Jesus has become our high priest. Now, um, he's talking to the, Jew the Jewish people. We've already established that. The book of Hebrews is really addressing the Jewish people. However, it can apply to the Gentiles as well, but primarily to the Jewish people. And so he's telling them, listen, I got good news and I got bad news. I got good news for all of you who believe because now you have a great high priest that, that, is, um, that is now in heaven. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But uh, bad news uh, for the high priest that's still in the synagogue because basically your job has been replaced. 
<laughs> and it reminds me of when Jesus, you know, he's there in front of Caiaphas, who was the high priest, and they were they right before he went to the cross, and and they were they were uh, challenging him and and asking him all of these questions, trying to trying to trap him. And you know, Jesus is thinking to himself, "Yeah, I'm about to have your job." <laughs> I love that. All right, well, maybe I'm the only one, but anyway. <laughs> All right, so what was the job of a high priest? So his job was basically to get man and God together, right? And so what he did is he was a man who had to go to God, and he had to represent on behalf of the people. So he had to represent the people to God. So he stands before God and he says, listen, I am here making intercession on behalf of the people. What is the other thing that he did? He also had to relate the people and he had to tell the people all about who God was. Remember he said to Peter, Peter's like, show me God. And um, I think it was Peter. It was one of them, Peter, I think. And he said, so, show me God, Philip. It was Philip. And he said, um, he said, listen, if you've seen me, you've seen God. And so it was, it's the high priest's job to then represent God to the people. So he was the vital link between God and man because ordinary man could not approach God. They had to have a priest that could go to God for them. Nobody can approach God unless he is Unless we have a priest. And that's the way it was always done. We, God set it up that we needed an intermediary between us and God. And, it, and so there, there would be someone, a link between God and man. But since Jesus died, he said, I have now become the high priest. Therefore, it is no longer necessary for you to come to me, me to go to God, and then come to you and to tell you what God said. Even though you can, I can operate in the prophetic, and I do that all the time. I go to God, and I carry um, you in my heart before God, and I do intercede on your behalf. But it's not like it, it was then where the people could not approach God whatsoever, and they couldn't hear God for themselves. Amen? So if a high priest is going to do this, he must know God and he must know man very well. Therefore, he must have an understanding of both the divine and the human nature. And Jesus was 100% God and he was 100% man. So he was fully qualified to do both. He could fully sympathize with us and, he, and have compassion on us, but he could also go before God and intercede on our behalf because of his holiness. So chapter five tells us this, and it concentrates on Jesus, um, on Jesus's human nature as man. And he did three things. This is what chapter five concentrates on. Number one, he can sympathize because he himself was tempted. Number two, he can offer sacrifice because he has been appointed. Number three, because he suffered, because he suffered, he has been perfected. And so those are the three qualifications and reasons why Jesus can qualify to be the high priest. And so I want to look at the first one. Number one, he can sympathize because he was tempted. I want to look at this in um, um, here in... Verse 15, um, in chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. All right, I've heard it, I've heard it preached that Jesus, that it says in all points, that Jesus experienced all temptations. And I've heard it preached that it included everything. Everything, every sin that man is exposed to or tempted to, Jesus was tempted in that. So it included gossip, slander, lying, bestiality, uh, pedophilia. But that's actually not what the word says. If you look at 
the Greek meaning where it says in all points. He, the writer of Hebrews was actually talking about a Roman soldier's armor. And so he was talking about the breastplate and the way that they put armor on, there had to be give to it so they could wear it during battle and it, and it would move with their bodies. And so there was chain mail and there was points along the, the, where it was connected all the way around where they considered those to be the weak spots. And so if you were going to try to kill them, you had to try to get them where the weak spot was or where the chink in the armor was. Does that make sense? So when he said that he was tempted in all points, it says that he was tempted in the spots where there could have been weakness. In other words, the spots where the promise was. He was tempted in the area of, the, uh, of where he was called to have authority. The area of, of what was promised for his life is the area of, of his weakness because what the enemy was trying to do is to try to get him to the promise in another way other than God. Okay, so remember what the temptations were. Uh, he said this, Satan said, I'm going to offer you the earth. Now Satan could do that because the keys were given to Satan and Satan is basically the earth manager. He is the guy that manages everything that goes on the earth. Why? Because Adam gave him the keys to that. He gave him the authority in the garden. So now, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, because guess what? We are in the playground of Satan. You know? And everybody's like, oh, it's God's fault. God's like, really? I'm the good guy. I'm trying to help you out. You need to work with me. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so where was it? So, so he goes, so there he is. That you, You've got the temptation of Christ, right? He's in the wilderness. He's getting tested. What is he getting tested with? He's getting tested with Satan taking him to a high mountain and saying, see all of this? I'll give you all of this. Which he had the authority to give Jesus all of that because Jesus was on the former side of the cross. And so Jesus, had he said yes, he didn't have to die to get all of the earth. I will give you all of the earth, he said. I'll give you everything. I'll give you all the power. I'll give you all the glory. I'll give you all the riches. And Jesus just said, behind me, Satan, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You know, so he's, he, again, he's using the word of God to, to diffuse the word of the enemy. What, what was another way he was tempted? That you're not tempted. I don't know about you, but have you had Satan come to you and said, take you to a high mountain and say, I'll give you all of this? No, because that's not part of my promise. I mean, I do ask for the nations for my inheritance, but you know what I mean? And so then he says to him, he looks at that rock and he said, hey, I know you're hungry. It's been 40 days and you're probably thinking you'd turn that rock into bread. Well, I've never had the enemy come to me and try to get me to turn a rock into bread because that's not a part of my inheritance. But he said, listen, let me tell you what, because he was supposed to walk in that level of miracle, right? And so he said, I want you to do this for me and I want you to perform it. And so he's saying to him, do what I'm telling you to do. Do it my way. And he said, look, don't tempt me in this. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Only God gets to tell me how to turn this rock, this stone to bread. And so he's saying, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it his way. Amen? And so you're going, the temptation will come to you in the place where your promise of victory lies. You see, now we can come to a God, and we know this, that understands our temptations because he too was, the, he experienced a pressure of something that he wanted so much. He wanted those promises. He came to the earth for those promises, and, 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 and he wanted them with all of his heart. And so the temptation was, you can take this, you can do this and get on the easy road. 
You don't have to die to have this. But he, but with us, the enemy comes the same way and says, look, you can do this the easy way. You can do this the way that we won't cost you anything. Just follow after me. And so he brings things to us that are like a, um, a counterfeit. It's counterfeit affection. I tell you what, instead of love, I'm going to give you lust. And I'm going to awaken lust in you. And it's going to cause you, it's going to consume you, but it's going to, it's, it will destroy you. Whereas love, the true thing that God has, even though at first it feels like it's the same. He said, no, 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 no. I'm going to give you a covenantal love that will bless your life. And it will cause you to multiply and increase and your heart to abound with goodness and righteousness. Amen. <clears throat> I love this one. Mm, you don't need to be meek, but I'll give you power and authority. But the word says that the meek shall inherit the earth. But, but the enemy says, no, no, don't be meek. Meek is weak. But we're called to be counter-cultural people where we take dominion in the ways of the kingdom because the, the, fool, the things of God are foolishness to the world. And the way that we function is foolishness to the world. But if we'll do it God's way, he will raise us up and we'll get everything that he promised. But we'll get it the right way and God will get the glory. Amen? All right, verse 16. Oh, no, there's not a verse 16. Yeah, it was late. I don't know how many of you saw, but um, I'm, I, you know, I've been working on this all week and I'm pulling it all together. And last night, um, um, my little granddaughter, Della, she kept coming up to me with her little doll and she was serenading me. And so she was like, la, la, la. And I'm like, I'm like trying to focus, but she's so cute, you know? So, uh, you know, who knows where we'll go today? Oh, yes, verse 16, in chapter 4, okay. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our help of need. And again, we no longer need a high priest, and, and including in Catholicism. You don't need somebody to stand between you and God anymore. And that's the beauty of it. Every single one of us, and as we go along, are called to be priests of the Most High God. Woo, this is such good news. The veil was torn. He's the high priest, but we get to function in the same order that he did. And, and we get to have the same kind, the same level of intimacy, the same level of nearness with his presence. So scripture says that um, we should have confidence and go boldly, you know, and be of good cheer because Jesus said, listen, you don't need to worry about it because I've overcome the world. And, and because I overcome the world, you know that you're going to be able to come overcome the world if you are in me. And so I love that because I know that there are times when, you know, I may have stumbled or I may have falled or you may have stumbled or you may have falled. And it's like one step back or two steps back, one step forward, two step, one step back, two step forward, however it goes with you. It's like country music you know John and I try to country dance and it is such an interesting thing to watch right baby <laughs> it is a beautiful thing uh anyway so he keeps saying stop leading and I I'm, never mind <laughs> I'm trying <sighs> um So yeah, going boldly before the throne of grace, we can run to him. We can run to him. He's like, I understand. I get you. I get it. I was there. I know. I understand. Let me, this is God. He's so great. He and I are hanging out up here talking about you, how much promise you have, how we're going to help you. All right, so let's, let's uh, read about number two, the second reason. He can offer sacrifice because he has been appointed. All right, so um, it says that he is appointed for men and called by God. 
Um, so let me read uh, verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. And then verse 4 And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So Aaron was appointed as a servant, but Jesus was appointed as a son. Amen? So they both offer sacrifices for sin, but I have, you have to know this. But Aaron not only was offering sacrifices for the sin of the people, he was also offering sacrifices for his own sin. But Jesus was sinless and never sinned, so therefore Jesus is only offering sacrifices for our sin, not his own. And Jesus was the perfected priesthood because he never sinned. He actually had a balanced approach to sin. And it's really interesting about this because a lot of times in the pastorate or whatever, when we have no sin in a particular area, we almost, or some people have no grace. Some of the leadership of the church, they have no grace for that sin. And they're very uh, condemning in the, their approach to it. And then in the areas that they do struggle in sin, there's almost like a don't worry about it attitude or a hyper graced attitude about that particular sin. So in a way, the, and the earthly priesthood was, um, was defective because it left, there was an imbalance in it. But Jesus, because he never sinned, he actually had so much balance. So the, the woman that was caught in adultery, he came to her with so much compassion and said, you know, I've run off all of those who are judging you. I don't judge you. But then he really brought a very uh, strong approach and said, but sin no more. I'll have compassion on you, but don't do this. And is he saying, don't do this because he's judging her? No, he's saying, don't do this because the end result will be really bad for you. And I love you, and I have compassion on you, and I have mercy on you, and I'm trying to help you lead a wonderful life. Because sin for a season is pleasurable, but it will devour you at the end of the story. All right, number three, the number third reason, because he has suffered, he has been perfected. So I'm going to read um, of chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, it's really interesting, um, these two verses, because he learned obedience by what he suffered, and he authored eternal salvation. Now, think about that for a minute. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was divine, 100% man, 100% God. It said that he actually learned obedience through suffering. Now, how many of you in your own lives have gone through some wilderness seasons and you're feeling a lot of suffering and pain? And and you have to make a choice in those times when things are hard. Which God you're going to serve? Because that's in the place where you get tempted, you're going to have to decide if you're going to be obedient to the word of God or you're going to be obedient to either ungodly beliefs or your emotions. Because your emotions, when you're in a bad situation, are typically lying to you. They're telling you things, but, and, and, and then when they oppose the word of God, those emotions are unsanctified emotions. And they are warring with the truth and the, and the, the beauty and the, and the love that God has for you. And it says that he authored your eternal salvation, which means that he wrote your story already from the beginning to the end. Your story has already been finished in heaven. It's already been completed. Pen went to paper, and every single line and every single word is over your life. And he said, if you are obedient, then you will complete the story that has been written for you. 
So if you're on page number, you know, 439, and, and, and you get offended at God, or you decide, I'm not going to be obedient to what God says, then you step off that page, and it's time to turn the page, but you're not even in the book anymore. He's like, hey, you need to get back on the page. You need to repent for your disobedience. Get back on the page so you can get back on the timeline of the words that I have authored about your life. Because he genuinely, with all of his heart, didn't die for part of your story. He died for the victory till the very end. And that's what this whole book is about. Complete the work that he started in us. Whew. All right, so he goes on then, and he's talking about the order of Melchizedek, and he talks about Melchizedek twice. He's quoting Psalm 110, and he says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. I am your father. Jesus, I am your father. <laughs> I doubt he said it like that, right? Maybe, I don't know. That would have been kind of cool. <laughs> um, but he said this, he's, and he's setting it up. This is what he's doing. He's setting it up. He's talking about the Melchizedek priesthood. And then he goes on and he says, listen, you guys are going to have to grow up real fast because I'm about to talk to you about something that's really deep. And it's deep revelation. And in order for you to get it, you've got to really focus. And he, and he talks about the differences between those that are stuck on milk. It's like, no, just give me milk. I actually don't want to have to work for this. I don't want to have to participate in it at all. And he said, listen, the thing about milk is that milk and meat are both protein, right? But milk, you just throw it down the gullet. There's not actually any exercise involved in it. But meat, you're actually going to have to cut it, and you're going to have to chew it. And you're going to have to chew it and chew it and chew it, meaning you're going to have to meditate on the word. You're going to have to read the word. And then you're going to have to read it again. And then you're going to have to read it again. And you're going to have to let it be digested. It is going to be more difficult for you for that to, to go through your members, to go through your body, than it is for milk. But he said, I, this is what I need for you to do. I need for you to grow up so you can receive this greater revelation because without it, you're going to continue to be babies. And I'm looking for champions in my kingdom. And I'm looking to raise up those who will finish the race well. And, I, and, and so I need you to get a handle on your, on your mind so that your mind is fully open to receive the fullness of what I want to say. Have I said that like a, a thousand times? So he's saying that if you will do this, then what will happen is that this level of revelation will actually be transformative. That this is really going to nourish you in a way where you won't be the same. Where there'll be a shift because you'll say, what? Wait a minute. If that's true, then this means really important things for my life. And how I'm going to live. And what you're saying to me is actually going to give me the ability to be successful all the way through. Okay. So he said this in Ephesians 4.14. He said, listen, if you, <clears throat> if you don't grow up, this is what's going to happen. Ephesians 4.14. Um, that we shall no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And he said, listen, if you will, if you will do this, then I'm telling you, you will be really anchored and you will, it says that you will be able to discern both good and evil. That you will, I will be able to use you. This is, this is those scriptures where he says, listen, I'm going to let you judge my house. You grow up like this. He said, I'm going to begin to give you authority. There's going to be an anointing that lands on you, and you're going to be able to speak to things, bring it down. You're going to be able to cause uh, 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 hurricanes and tornadoes to stop in their track. You're going to be able to uh, break down the, uh, the terrorist attacks. You're going to be able to stop bullets in midair. If you do this, you're going to really be able to grow up. I'm going to, I need a church that's mature when I come back. Amen. All right, so let's stand. 
Well, Father, I just thank you for your word, God. I thank you for Hebrews. I thank you that Hebrews is not just words on a page, God, but it is a book that trains an army. I thank you, Father, that it is a book that grows us up so that we can run and run well. And I just bless you, God, for this book. Father, I bless you for it this summer, and I thank you for it. God, I pray that this book will go deep into ourselves, that we will adopt and adapt to the word of God, and that, and that everyone here, as we hear this word and are taught by this word, we will start to come into alignment. And God, we will begin to run together as a great and beautiful army um, designed by your hand. And so we just bless you, God, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And every Everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you've been inspired by this message, we invite you to partner with us by visiting storehousedallas.com forward slash give.